Hello and welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the residents and staff at Zion. Welcome to our St Paul's members who are watching this service at home and welcome to anyone else who may be simply joining us online. We begin as always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is the 12th Sunday after Pentecost and the worship responses will appear on your screen in the bold type and I invite you to join me in the opening responses. Praise God for the Lord our God is King. Let, Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us praise his greatness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, to receive honour and glory and praise. He loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to join in singing the hymn, Crown Him With Many Crowns. The Lord be with you. 
and And also also with with you. Let us pray for God's church on earth. Thank you, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, that you have established your church on earth and opened the door to your Father's presence. Build us up as your church on the sure foundation of faith in you. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first Bible reading for today comes from Isaiah chapter 56, beginning at verse 1. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation. For a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel reading for today comes from Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven." Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise be be to you, you, O Christ. Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today we continue our sermon series on the Lord's Prayer, and our petition for today is forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And I would have to say that this is by far the most confronting of all the petitions in the Lord's Prayer. And so before we launch into the sermon, let's take a moment to ask for God's grace as we hear his word for us today. 
Dear Lord, open our hearts and minds to hear the wonder, the beauty, the truth, the mercy and the grace which you pour out for us so freely. Bless us as we hear your word today. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, within the different church traditions that I know many of you come from, there are different words used in this petition of the Lord's Prayer. Some versions of the Lord's Prayer say, forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our debts or our transgressions. And quite simply, the reason that there are different words used here is because the two accounts of the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 6, there are four different Greek words used all together. And so the different translations of the words that are used there. But I want to pick up one of those words that is used and what it means. The Lutheran Church had a national synod in Toowoomba going back some years now. And I was attending the event and I wanted to be in a quiet place where I could speak to my wife on the phone privately without my conversation echoing around the, the walls of the university campus where we were holding this gathering. And so I saw a thick row of trees with a small opening in between the trees and I could see an open field behind those trees. So I thought if I could just duck through there into the open field, it would be much quieter and more private. And indeed it was. I was thrilled when I got through the, uh, the row of trees. But as I continued talking to my dear wife on the phone, I heard some strange noises. I heard a swooshing sound. It didn't take me long to work out that I was actually standing behind the target on an archery range. There was people firing real arrows. And so I ducked back real quick through the bushes again, back into the university property. I had been unknowingly trespassing. I'd crossed a boundary and gone over a line where I wasn't really allowed to be and where it was dangerous for me to be. You know, in this petition, we are asking God to forgive us when we have trespassed, when we have gone beyond the boundaries that God has set for us in his word, when we've crossed the lines that God has said that we shouldn't cross because it's dangerous to go there. And so the word sin is quite literally missing the mark, like an archer shooting his arrow, uh, an arrow that falls short or wide of God's target. And so each of these words, whether we use the word debt or trespass or transgression, they're all about us doing the wrong thing, falling short of what God wants of us and asks of us. They're different words, but they have the same meaning in, end, in the end, which is that we sin. We are asking God to forgive our sinfulness. And not just our weaknesses and our little slip-ups, but to forgive our deliberate actions, the times when we openly defy God's will. And that's not just obvious things, but even those sins where we're not aware of it and we don't even know that we're doing it, that's included when we ask God to forgive us. The things that we fail to do. When we, for instance, turn a blind eye to those who truly need us. When we hear someone's reputation being trashed by someone else and we just let it happen. You know, as Christians, we understand the first part of this petition where we are simply acknowledging to God that we are in the wrong and we are seeking God's forgiveness and mercy. And praise God that he is merciful and forgiving. He has paid for all of our sins through the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the second part, though, of this petition that we find perhaps troubling. When we say, as we forgive those who sin against us. And so our forgiveness from God seems to be linked to our forgiving of other people. Is it contingent? Which comes first? Is it the chicken or the egg? You know, C.S. Lewis once said, we all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we have to practice it. And Sigmund Freud put his thoughts a different way. He said, one must forgive one's enemies, but not before they've been hanged. 
We know it is so hard to forgive even little things. I read how Katy Perry, a popular singer, was performing a concert at her old high school and in the people that were there that day, she saw a former classmate in the crowd. And this was a guy that she'd had a crush on as a teenager, the quarterback heartthrob. And he had turned her down. Now, it's many years later. She's an international star, and yet she couldn't let it go. She couldn't forgive him. And so she publicly, multiple times, ridiculed and humiliated him in front of everyone and then dedicated a particularly spiteful song to him. It's so hard to forgive even little things. But what about the big things? You know, in 2002, there were Bali bombings occurred, killing over 200 people. 88 of those were Australians. And a couple of years later, there was a memorial service on TV, an anniversary of that event. And there was an interview with a father who had lost his son in Bali. And the man said that if the Indonesians can't find someone to hold the rifle to the heads of those terrorists, who killed his son, he said he will gladly do it. And I read to you uh, the things that he said. I quote to you, the quicker they shoot those three, the better off I think we will all be. If they can't find nobody to do it, believe me, we've got two, maybe three here today who will hold the rifle to them without even thinking about it. It won't take the pain away, but it will just give us relief instead. And so whether we agree or not with what he expressed, I think at some level we can appreciate to some extent where his reaction is coming from. You know, we've all had people sin against us. And when someone sins against us, we want justice. We want retribution. We want to see them suffer a similar amount of pain that we've gone through or maybe more. When someone has destroyed our reputation or our dreams, someone's destroyed our innocence or hurt our loved ones, rejected our gift of love, when we feel violated in some way or our trust has been destroyed, we want justice. Against this, the words of Jesus stand and starkly confront us. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. These are very hard words, but the implication is quite clear. Our lack of forgiveness of others can jeopardise our forgiveness from God. And just in case there was any doubt, if you think I'm reading too much into this petition, the passage that follows immediately after the Lord's Prayer, we see Jesus expanding on what he had said in the Lord's Prayer. And he says, for if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's not my words, that's the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. You know, C.S. Lewis made comment on this, and he said, No part of Jesus' teaching is clearer, and there are no exceptions to it. Jesus doesn't say that we are to forgive other people's sins, providing they're not too frightful, or providing there are extenuating circumstances, or anything of that sort. We are to forgive them all, however spiteful, however mean, however often they are repeated. If we don't, we shall be forgiven none of our own. Well, that seems humanly impossible because we know the pain and the hurt inflicted upon us by others can be so extreme. And yet, I remember reading a woman describing her struggle to forgive. She just couldn't forgive her in-laws for what they had done. They had made her life miserable, so she and her husband had moved away. But that didn't help. She, She wanted to forgive them and move on from it all, but she said she couldn't. She admitted in the end it was like a drug, and she had become addicted to the drama, and it was consuming her. 
And she admitted that she actually thought about them more than she thought about her own family. See, sometimes it can be that it's not actually about I can't forgive, but I don't want to forgive or I will not forgive. And that's what our human nature would rather do. It would rather condemn those who sin against us. But the tragic thing about unforgiveness is that we think we are getting back, that we're hurting the other person by holding a grudge. And I know I've been there and I've done that, but it's really only ourselves that we end up hurting. Grudges just tear up individuals and families and churches and communities and whole nations. In fact, the medical profession tells us that the number one source of stress is people holding a grudge and not forgiving. You know, in years gone by, there were monkey trappers in North Africa who used to have a very clever method of catching their prey. They would get some hardened gourds, um, hollow, dried out fruit shell, maybe a bit like a coconut. And they would fill it with nuts and firmly fasten it to the branch of a tree. They'd drill a hole in this hardened shell, just large enough for the monkey to stick its paw into the hollow shell to grab the nuts. But the hungry animal soon discovered that when he, the monkey gra grasps a handful of nuts, that the hole is too small for the monkey to withdraw its clenched fist. And it doesn't have enough sense to open its hand and let go in order to escape. And so the monkey is easily taken captive. It's actually held prisoner by its own doing because it refuses to let go. And maybe that's a picture for what we sometimes end up doing. Now, for one minute, I am not denying the horrible hurt and pain that others may have done to you personally. God knows the depth of your suffering. And it doesn't make it right. But when we continue to hold the rage and the bitterness, when we refuse to forgive, we end up becoming the ones trapped by it. That anger which burns in our hearts, the desire for revenge, the wish for the pain to be inflicted in return, it ends up trapping us and leading us into sin. And so this petition challenges us to the core about our attitudes of unforgiveness which need to be confessed. You know, God's word tells us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our capacity to forgive, though, and our capacity to process uh, through this forgiveness of others who have harmed us, it depends entirely, though, on God's forgiveness towards us first. And Praise God that he takes the initiative. He makes the first unbelievably gracious, merciful, loving move toward us without us even requesting it. That's why he is called the friend of sinners, the, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the, the world. You know, we read in Romans chapter 5 verse 8 that God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Christ has lived this prayer. Christ has lived out forgiving those who sinned against him because that is you and me on that splintered wooden cross at Calvary. With the sin of the world on his shoulders, Jesus takes even our unwillingness to forgive to the cross. Jesus paid the ultimate penalty for our sins of not forgiving others. And consequently, we are set free from our bondage, set free for a new way of life. We are set free to be able to forgive others. And so as we acknowledge our sinfulness, we receive that forgiveness from Christ. And then the Spirit of God can begin to work in us and through us. God's forgiveness flowing through us to our neighbour. 
like the showers of rain that fall from the heavens and run along the channels of the streams and the creek beds and the rivers moving outward. God forgives us. He pours his forgiveness upon us and that propels his forgiven people towards the process of forgiving others. You know, I've shared with a number of you, I think, in my pastor's classes about a member of a previous congregation who felt extremely wounded and betrayed by their family over a particular issue. And this woman told me that she could no longer come to Holy Communion. Her anger was so great and she had tried to forgive, but she simply couldn't do it. And so she couldn't come to communion anymore. But I encouraged her. I encouraged her to keep coming to the Lord's Supper because, as I said to her, how else will she ever have the strength to forgive another one? That strength can only come from God's forgiveness of us. So I encouraged her to confess her failure to forgive. You see, forgiveness cannot be hoarded. It's impossible to store it up for another day. It's like the air we breathe. You can't take in one big breath to last for the whole year. We need to inhale and exhale moment by moment, day by day. And that's how it is with God's forgiveness. We need to inhale it day after day and then exhale it. And that's why we have confession and absolution every single week so that we can breathe in again God's forgiveness and so that we can breathe it out. But when we fail to forgive others, we cut off the hose, we turn off the tap and stop that supply of forgiveness flowing through us. Now, just to be absolutely crystal clear, God doesn't wait till we forgive others to start forgiving us. He forgives us first. He showers his forgiveness upon us. But our refusal to forgive others stops his flow of forgiveness in our lives. When we receive the forgiveness of Christ, though, when he lives in us, then Christ does in us what is humanly not possible. And so in the end, forgiveness, our forgiveness of others, is an act of faith. We trust that God is better at doing justice than we are. Yes, we may truly want justice to rain down upon that individual like a ton of bricks, But when we pray this prayer, we hand control back to him and we leave it to him to deal with things in his good time. I read the true story that occurred in 1958. A young Korean exchange student was studying at the University of Pennsylvania. He went to post a letter to his parents and turning from the mailbox, he stepped into the path of a gang of young men, 11 teenage boys. And what looks like it was racially motivated, they attacked him. They beat him with their fists, with their shoes. They beat him with a lead pipe. And the police found him dead in the gutter. The whole city of Philadelphia cried out for vengeance. The district attorney got legal authority to try the boys as adults. But then a letter arrived from Korea. And it made everyone stop and think. It was signed by the dead boy's parents, and by 20 other relatives from his family. And this is what they wrote, and I read it to you. Our family has met together and we have decided to petition that the most generous treatment possible within the laws of your government be given to those who have committed this criminal action. In order to give evidence of our sincere hope contained in this petition, we have decided to save money to start a fund to be used for the religious, educational, vocational and social guidance of the boys when they are released. We have dared to express our hope with a spirit received from the gospel of our Saviour Jesus Christ who died for our sins. See, through Christ... It is actually possible to do what is humanly impossible, to have a forgiving spirit. And there's actually comfort in forgiving others. As Luther said when he commented on this petition, he said, when we say those words, as we forgive those who have sinned against us, 
he found that clause very comforting. As we hear those words on our lips, I forgive you, then we know for absolute sure that God's forgiveness is flowing in us and through us, that we are forgiven. As you forgive others, you have the comfort and assurance of knowing that you are forgiven by Almighty God. And so for a few moments, I would like to invite you to reflect in silence. To reflect on the two sides of this petition before we then come and confess our sins to God our Father. So firstly, to reflect upon what sins do you need forgiven by God? What do you need to confess to God? And then what sins do you need to forgive? Who has hurt you? Who has stolen your joy, your love, your dignity? In today's gospel reading, our Lord Jesus Christ said to the Apostle Peter and to the disciples that whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven, and whoever sins you retain, they are retained. God has given to his church the authority to forgive those who confess their sins and to declare on the behalf of Christ that forgiveness is theirs, as if God himself stood in front of them and declared it to them. And so I invite you now to come before our Lord and confess your sins to our Heavenly Father. Most merciful God, we confess to you and before one another that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words and actions. We, we have, have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. As a called and ordained servant of the word of God, on behalf of my Lord Jesus Christ and by his command, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God's peace be with you. Amen. We join together in singing the hymn, Chief of Sinners Though I Be.
The prayer of the church today reflects our sermon theme. And so the response is as follows. O merciful God who forgives all our sins, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the mercy you have showered upon us through Jesus Christ and for his gift of forgiveness. Grant that we too may be people who live out grace and forgiveness in our daily lives. Where there is continuing bitterness or difficulty to forgive or to let go of hurts, bring healing and peace and melt stubborn hearts and wills so that marriages, families, friendships and neighbourhoods may be renewed. O merciful God who forgives all our sins, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for those people who through no fault of their own have been persecuted, victimised, exploited or abused. Hear their cries for justice, Lord, and wipe their tears away. Reassure them of your love for them. Help them to look to the cross of Christ for renewed hope and healing. O merciful God who forgives all our sins, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for your church on earth and for those who serve abroad in your mission to the world. We thank you for the relationship that has been established between Grace Lutheran College at Rothwell and Caboolture and two Lutheran schools in Indonesia. Bless their partnership so that both groups are encouraged in faith, in service and in mission in their local community. O merciful God who forgives all our sins, Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for pastors and all church leaders as they seek to minister under constantly changing conditions. Help those carrying heavy loads to not be overwhelmed. Provide support and encouragement. Grant that our congregation and all churches would be able to find enough willing helpers to fulfil all the necessary tasks that are needed so that we and they can safely gather in worship. O merciful God who forgives all our sins, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Lead and direct the state and federal governments of this land that they may seek good relationships between states and between neighbouring countries, especially during this time of pandemic. Where ill will and disappointment is felt, Grant that it would not escalate, but be peacefully discussed and resolved. Where communities are torn apart through racism or lack of forgiveness, and where old wounds between countries still produce conflicts, bring healing and restoration. O merciful God, who forgives all our sins, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Within our congregation, in the child care centre, at the Lodge and at Zion Home, we pray for a willingness to resolve issues as they occur and to seek goodwill and forgiveness where necessary. Where families and staff are at odds over dealing with particular situations, grant positive ways forward. Where congregational members have hurt one another or feel let down, let there be renewed relationships and forgiveness. Grant that everything that happens on this campus would be for your glory and in service of your mission. O merciful God who forgives all our sins, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Remember those in need of healing or support. Grant relief from pain and renewal of strength to those suffering with various conditions, diseases, major sickness, injury or mobility issues. Remember those especially who have been confined to their homes and those who are unable to join with us at this time. O merciful God who forgives all our sins, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to the prayers we bring before you. Lead us to respond to the great love you have shown through your Son by offering ourselves in service to you so that your love may be seen also through us. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen. We pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favour and give you his peace. Amen.